Hello everyone, Alexa Dunn here, and today I'm very excited to be going over my favorite and the most disappointing books that I read in 2020. Wait. Oh, cat break. You're so sweet. Oh, I love you. Oh, you're so bright. You're so bright. Well, best and worst is a nice clickbaity shorthand. I really think of these in terms of favorites, standouts, the books that kind of stuck with me, that like I kept thinking about throughout the year, that I really enjoyed and recommend all the time, versus ones that didn't meet my expectations in some ways. The disappointing ones are in the back half of the video, I'm making you wait, and you'll see that they really do run the gamut. Some of them are literally just, I wasn't sure about the ending, others are more like, this was not what I thought it was gonna be, and a few of them flat out, I I genuinely didn't like. But that list is more of a mixed bag, whereas the first half, the ones I loved, yeah, let's just talk about books that I thought were super excellent that I loved in 2020. In the cases of both lists, these are in no particular order, it's just kind of how I saw them on my Goodreads as I was going through everything that I read over the last year. So the first favorite from 2020 is The Good Girl's Guide to Murder. Uh, one of the best YA thrillers I've read in years. She's now up there with me, Holly Jackson, with Kara Thomas in terms of, I know that she can deliver a really soapy, textured, layered, twisty YA thriller. It is hard to pull one off that has like a lot of pathos and is kind of dark and this one really nailed it. It nailed all aspects of the premise for me and I actually have an arc of the next one. I'm super excited to read it because this one really set the tone for an excellent 2020 with YA thrillers and there are other ones on the list. If you are a fan of soapier, high-concept thrillers generally, whether that's adult or YA, if something that's a little serial-ish, that has a podcasty type conceit-ish to it, then The Good Girl's Guide to Murder would be a good one to pick up. I think of it as a YA serial. It has a student kind of doing a high school project angle to investigate a cold case and someone who the person investigating believes was falsely accused of killing a young girl. The next two are nonfiction. I had a really good year for nonfiction. If You Tell by Greg Olson. This was an engrossing five star read, but it is a very dark and disturbing book. So this one's not gonna be for everyone, but it just, it scratched all my itches. It ticked every box. Just an ideal example of narrative nonfiction. You can tell that the author Guy Golson is a fiction writer, a talented fiction writer. It's a true story, but it reads like a novel. If you are interested in true crime, real stories, psychopathy, messed up families, questions about guilt and culpability, I recommend it, but with the trigger warning of it is dark, it gets graphic, and <sighs> It has a lot of instances of child abuse and general physical and emotional abuse in it, and that is simply not for everyone, but I was really sucked in. I found it fascinating. I said it in my original review. It was one of the most compelling in-depth portraits of a female psychopath from young childhood through to adulthood with the depth of the crimes that they committed, and you could really track and kind of see the aspects of this person's messed up psychology. I thought it was a really interesting read. The next one is Mommy Dearest, also a really difficult read. This one comes with a trigger warning as well for, again, child abuse and narcissistic personality disorder, specifically narcissistic parents. This is a famous memoir from the 70s by Christina Crawford, who was Joan Crawford's adopted daughter, was turned into a cult classic campy movie, and that's why I read this. I was like, I should read this thing, and the actual memoir is so fascinating. It's got that old Hollywood glam, like glimpsing behind the curtain, but then it is an in-depth, chronological portrait of someone raised by a narcissistic parent, but it also touches on the complicated feelings of loving your parent, loving a complicated, imperfect parent who essentially also abuses you, but you still want that parent to love you, you want to earn their love, and what a dangerous concept that is. And because I did read the 40th anniversary edition, there is a foreword, 
and also additional material that wasn't in the original memoir and it makes for a really interesting well-rounded read because Christina Crawford was able to reflect even more on her abusive childhood and kind of also reflect on her mother as an adult. I, I just, it was really good. Next is When No One Is Watching by Alyssa Cole. This is an adult thriller that came out in September and the anxiety I had while reading this was intense. Uh, <laughs> Partly because of my own personal adulting things, I really related to the main character on several levels. But if you want a thriller that is scary, I actually had someone ask me recently, what are some thrillers that are scary? Because those are the kinds of books that their loved one likes to read and they were trying to get them Christmas presents. And I thought, and the first book that came to my mind was this one. Not all thrillers are creepy and scary. This one is, but it is the slow creep. It's got this, I mean, it's comp to get out for a reason and you definitely get those vibes of like you're in this story and you know that something is going on and you're like, what? is happening and then things happen to people. I was like screaming at the book for the main character to get out of situations and then it has this really big soapy ending that I found emotionally satisfying. Plus because Alyssa Cole is a talented romance reader it had a strong and good romance thread. Not every thriller has that. Just when no one was watching was one of the most visceral reads of 2020 for me that really sucked me in, made me anxious and upset, and then like smacked me in the face at the ending. It was a really memorable and satisfying read. It stuck with me. I read it I think in June and I'm still, or July, and it's still kind of like, I vividly can tap in to moments of that book and you cannot say that about every book that you read. The next one kind of goes into this. This is another favorite YA thriller 2020 and that is All Eyes on Her by L.E. Flynn. This one scratched the itch of Dateline YA thriller for me. I mean it's really like ripped right from the headlines. It's a girl who may or may not have murdered her boyfriend on a hike but you get the story from everyone's perspective but hers for the majority of the book. It's how everyone else sees this girl. It is definitely a commentary it, on relationships, on women, on sexism, on misogyny, on rape culture. It's complex and layered. So many of the characters are just like prickly and have texture. A lot of unlikable characters but in a good way. I blew through it because I was like, what happened though? What is the truth about this girl? Who is Tabitha really? And it has one of those kind of unsettling endings where technically it both gives you an answer and doesn't give you an answer except what I like. Sometimes when a book does that you get mad because what you had come before didn't actually give you enough concrete little nuggets to draw your own conclusion. But what I liked about this one, it technically has a nebulous ending, but I personally feel there was enough evidence in the rest of the book for me to draw my own personal conclusion about what I think happened. Thus for me, satisfying ending. Seriously, if you want Dateline YA in a book, it is all eyes on her by Ellie Flynn, one of my favorite reads of the year. Next, another like hormone thriller that like scratched an itch I had had for literally years. I talked about it in multiple videos, My Kingdom, for a book that does the boarding school secrets trope, jumping back and forth between that and the past and people in the present. And I had read several that I found disappointing. And then I finally picked up this book by Michelle Campbell, which came out years ago. And so they, they're, it's technically like college. So like a good chunk of the book, like almost half of the book is in the past freshman year of college. These girls are roommates. They come from very different backgrounds. And you know that something terrible happens midway through or partway through freshman year that changes everything. Cause you're also getting these women in their forties in the same college town. One who has returned after a long time the other two are technically friendly with each other but like you know things went down and it's that kind of back and forth and what I love about this trope I love where you see the young version of a character and you see the old version of a character you see cause and effect you see relationship shift you're guessing at secrets and this book delivered plus there's some ridiculously rich people in this book. So you get rich asshole tropes, you get them going to like ridiculous beach houses. It just ticks 
so many boxes for me. So if you also like kind of, it's domestic suspense, but it's like got one foot almost in like YA tropes because of all the college stuff, ideal read. Again, such, I had a very good 2020 for books, I feel. It's like I finally like read a couple of books that just like gave me exactly what I wanted. So it's always the husband, such a good book. Next is another nonfiction book, Trial by Fire. I guess all my favorite nonfictions this year are really difficult to read and come with trigger warnings. This one does as well. It was a surprise, uh, something I found on NetGalley, uh, an event that I vaguely knew about. Very famous nightclub fire in Rhode Island, one of the deadliest in American history. I, th I th think it's the deadliest fire in, in American history. Um, really awful. It happened when I was in college, so I was like aware of it, but I didn't know a lot about it. Uh, it's an excellent journalistic accounting of what happened, as well as the aftermath, and it explores a lot of ideas about kind of survivor's guilt, victims, like people who are actually in the fire who survived and kind of their their lives and their emotions and their feelings about the whole thing c contrasted and compared with the family members of people who perished in the fire. And you know, there's, there's some very, actually very interesting conflicts there. It also goes in depth and interviews and follows the nightclub owners, the people who were blamed for what happened. It talks about the ban. It's a really interesting story. It even examines the nature of journalism itself, which I really appreciated, because it talks about the photojournalist who's there taking pictures instead of helping people, and there are questions there of the local reporting and kind of some irresponsible things that may or may not have happened with the media. If that kind of stuff appeals to you, I highly recommend it. It's an emotional book though, it really packs a punch. It's, you go in and there are different profiles of people that you're getting and you realize a nice chunk of the people that this journalist is introducing to me died. Uh, and that's a lot. Uh, there are a, some graphic descriptions. It's less graphic than say, if you tell, but it's definitely, you have to really come to terms with a horrific fire. And it's a lot to read, but it's a read that I really enjoyed. Um, so yeah, it, it was one of the better books that I read in 2020. Back to thrillers. <laughs> so one that surprisingly stuck with me, I feel like I get one of these a year at least, a book that I read in like January as an arc, and it's coming out in the summer, it's happened twice, two years in a row, but it like sticks with me, and I keep thinking of, about it, and I get to the end of the year, and I find that every time someone's asking me for a thriller wreck, I'm recommending this book, and also in both cases, I feel like people really slept on them. So one of my favorite books of the year was His and Hers by Alice Feeney. I think the reason this one really landed for me, I like Sometimes I Lie as well, but I I landed a, in a little bit more of a tricky position on that one, but this one, unequivocal five stars, highly recommend. It's basically Sleepy British Village, maybe a serial killer who's like doing weird culty murder, Mean Girls from Boarding School. You know, it's really hitting those tropes. But it's also technically domestic suspense with really messy like character relationships. Because it's dual POV, his and hers, uh. <laughs> And one is a BBC reporter, so she's going back to her hometown to investigate these murders of people she knows, because she needs that big break to get her job back. Long story there. And the other is her ex-husband, who is the small town cop, who's also investigating this murder, and they are suspecting each other of various things. He suspects her of meddling or possibly being responsible. She suspects him of maybe stalking her, and what if he killed someone out of revenge? So they are like both suspecting each other. So much is going on. There were a lot of twists. And yeah, it, it's basically Sleepy British Village, romantic conflict in the two POVs, and creepy serial murders of mean girls from boarding school. Like, I just love a good, like, British vibe thriller, and this is it. And it has been optioned, and I'm, like, ready for that HBO miniseries. Like, yeah. I don't know if it's gonna be on HBO, I just think it should be, so, yeah. So, next, we're coming up on the last ones. I basically picked 10, and then I have some honorable mentions. So, I waffled on the next one, but ultimately decided it delivered a good enough reading experience that it really is a standout for 2020 for me. I mean, I, 
I had such like feelings and reaction to it, I reread it for a live show. So that is One by One by Ruth Ware. I did find on reread that there were things that I didn't like quite as much the second time around, but like, it's one of my all time favorite thriller tropes, isolation trope, basically ski chalet, avalanche, trapped in a house with a murderer. I am just like here for that kind of thing and I'd say it executes that trope very very well. The things that I was a bit more uh about are other things that don't have to do with that trope and we honestly just don't get enough high concept commercial thrillers that nail that trope. There have been some that haven't really nailed it and so one by one is a standout and generally Ruth Ware is one of my favorite authors and like it's a good year when you get a Ruth Ware book so yeah. And then last but certainly not least is The Night Swim by Megan Golden. This is another one I read kind of earlier in the year and it definitely it's a stick to your ribs kind of book and she is the author of the other one that took that title for 2019. I read her book The Escape Room very early in 2019. I think literally the first or second week of January and I couldn't stop thinking about it the whole year. It came out in August. People really slept on it and that made my favorites list last year. So The Night Swim is very similar. Uh, a lot harder to read actually. It's a book about rape culture basically but it also does the podcast trope, it does the small town secrets and it really fires on those cylinders. I liked what it had to say and I like how it said it. It made me uncomfortable when it needed to make me uncomfortable. It kept me guessing it where I wanted to be guessing and the ending was pretty satisfying. Also had some rich people doing ridiculous things but I liked the plot conceit going back and forth between the podcast journalist in the present and the story from the past and generally I just I really like the way Megan Golden writes. It's a book that sucked me in, took me along, and is kind of a no-brainer for me to recommend provided you are okay with the subject matter which can be hard to read at times. So I do have honorable mentions. These are books that were really really good. They just weren't like obvious like these were my favorites of the year but they're still darn good books that I think are worth a mention. The first is The Perfect Guess. I read this very recently and it's actually not out yet. Part of the reason it didn't go on the, the main favorites list but also like little quibbles in one of the POVs and like part of the book but overall a really satisfying like sleepy British gothic-y type book that like hit a lot of tropes that I really like. So if you like, also kind of why a crossover in a way because it does have one POV in the past that is a teen girl but it's got the creepy house, it's got the family secrets, it's got something happened in the creepy house and you don't know what it was in the past but now there's a murder mystery party taking place at the creepy house. Like it's got some good tropes in it and I really enjoyed it. Next is The Wife Who Knew Too Much by Michelle Campbell and the only reason it's an honorable mention is I loved It's Always the Husband so much more. It's it's like a top book for me now and I didn't want to like load the list with more than one Michelle Campbell book. The Wife Who too, Knew Too Much was really really good. It hit it hit tropes that like I can't say for spoilers but it hit them very well. I'll say like classic gothic domestic suspense tropes, got a lot of ridiculous rich people which I always really really enjoy and it had some good twists and turns. And then the last plate is another one kind of a sleeper that just like again it kind of stuck to my ribs a bit like it was an unusual one for me in that it, it, it has like feelings of women's fiction only but with a really good suspense thread and it's been six months and, and like I still like think about kind of the mood and tone of it and like strong feelings. I said it in my original review like it had an ending that was kind of a gut punch for me and it was just a really enjoyable book. Uh, kind of an unexpected little gem and so that that gets an honorable mention for me. And then my honorable mentions for non-fiction. Two books that were really really good. I just didn't want to overload my list with non-fiction because I had these other really good non-fiction books. I just had a great year for non-fiction so my honorable mentions are Road to Jonestown which I, that was in my most recent wrap up and like if you're interested in cults and interested in Jonestown it's an excellent journalistic accounting from start to finish and beyond really kind of meaty read to sink your teeth into and then bad 
bled about Theranos. That was also just a really meaty, compelling read that I highly recommend if that is a story that fascinates you. Another really good example of corporate sociopathy that I thought was just really illustrative to read. But you have kept tuned in because you want to hear about the disappointing books of 2020. Hey! These will not be a surprise because these were all featured in my previous wrap-ups, but let's just start with the one that you know I like flat out hated. I made an entire standalone review about how bad this book was, and it was a craft book, which almost feels like cheating, but hey, I, I read it and it was my fault. How to write a damn good thriller was just not very good. I will link below to that in-depth review if you want to hear all the reasons, but in short, it was pedantic, it had all these weird examples from like fake made up books by this writer, I didn't like any of them. None of his, or very few of his examples of a thriller were thrillers, or at least the modern definition of thriller, the useful current commercial definition. And like, the cover says something like a step-to-step -step guide and there really weren't steps. It just, it was a painful reading experience. I had to like push through it because we were doing a live show on it. And I must apologize again to Kevin and Laura for making them read this craft book. It was very, very bad. Next is just, it's it's a disappointing one. This is, we're getting into the ones that just didn't quite land. Like I had to look, like what did I give three stars to? So the next one is The Menendez Murders. Uh, again, it was interesting, but a case where I felt that the author, who was a journalist, was a little too close to one side of the aisle. It did have some even-handed coverage in it, yet it still was just very clear, like it's like these things kind of like bleed in, <laughs> bleeding, um, that the journalist really was close to the brothers, sided with the brothers in a way, empathized with the brothers. I mean, I think he even says at some point in the book he really thinks they should be let out of jail, and it's just, it was kind of like, hmm, okay, and it, it just, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's just an example where like the information was very interesting and of course he had unprecedented access because he he is basically friendly with both of the men and his brothers and so they talked to him but on the flip side I think it compromised his bias his basically ability to have more of a bird's eye view or even to speak to certain people I would bet you cash hard money that there were certain sources that could have been very interesting to talk to to get an additional perspective on the Menendez parents and the Menendez brothers who wouldn't speak to this guy because they know that he's basically on Eric and Lyle's side and that's always going to color what you're going to get as an end product. So it just kind of, it, it was a, a bit of a disappointment for me. Next I have two thrillers that I, I liked perfectly well enough. I think I gave them both four stars but when I really thought about like books that didn't meet my expectations or I had enough to say about in the review, I thought it was fair to include these. So the first one is The Truth Hurts. This is in my most recent wrap up and this was just one where the third act went places and kind of spun the narrative up into this whipped frenzy where I no longer believed in kind of the emotions and the motivation of the main character in particular and I just wasn't very happy with kind of, I mean there's soap and there's cheap soap. And so it was just a case where I got to the big reveal and it didn't sit right with me. Um, I have I cover it more in depth in my Goodreads review which does have spoiler tags but it's something with the treatment of mental health and kind of the repercussions and it's always tricky in a book like this where a character has a secret and it's like it's a horrible secret and then you get to it and if it doesn't sit with you right it doesn't sit with you right and the horrible secret was the underpinning of a motivation for a final twist in the book and so I really hated the final twist of the book, or it just didn't land right with me. And so it was a book where 85% of it was a home run read for me. I just fell flat at the ending. So ultimately, it's kind of a disappointment for me, especially because it, it nails so many of the gothic romantic suspense tropes, like serious Rebecca vibes for a lot of the book. And then yeah, the, the ending just didn't quite land. 
And then this secret thing, this was one where I covered this again in depth in my review, where it I think it had too many POVs, there were choices made with the POVs, where ultimately it's a book that was trying to juggle too many balls all at once. Now a good suspense or thriller read should have a lot of balls up in the air and there should be red herrings that kind of dissolve out. But this is the first case in a long time where I saw that happen through multi-POV where essentially I feel some of the POVs weren't needed. Those kind of suspense threads and red herrings would have been more effective if they were executed and teased out and dissolved with fewer POVs. The book felt unfocused at a certain point and it was just overwhelming all of the kind of modern day suburban me too family problem problems that it was trying to deal with all at once. The main thrust was good. I enjoyed the main thrust of the novel but it it tried to do too much and so ultimately it's pro honestly probably not going to be one that's going to like stick with me long term. So Next, because we're just talking about expectations and disappointments, was a serial killer's daughter. This is by the daughter of the BTK killer, and it's really my fault. I had certain expectations I took in, and it said right on the cover, spiritual journey, and I just didn't quite connect it, and ultimately why this was a disappointing read for me. It's not the book's fault, but I do know that other readers had the same feelings. I like looked through the reviews. It is just as much about like, hey, my dad was this super famous serial killer as it is about finding God, finding Jesus, how like spiritualism and Jesus and the church really saved this woman's life, which is really, really great. You want someone to have that support, to have that grace, to have something to turn to when you discover that your dad's a horrible serial killer. But it meant that a lot of the book focused on the spiritual journey. And that's generally not the kind of storytelling that I gravitate toward. I can't relate to it personally and so I tend not to go toward faith-based narratives. It is ultimately a faith-based memoir. I don't regret reading it. It was still incredibly compelling and you definitely got some insights into BTK as a person and a father and Carrie Rawson's journey really is interesting. I think she's a strong, mature, thoughtful, lovely person but yeah it was basically just not quite for me because it was a, a little too Jesus-y. <laughs> Next is The Girls Are Gone, which is one where I actually really enjoyed reading it. I didn't dislike the book, but it's kind of that kind of expectations versus reality thing. But as I covered in my review, the issue with this one was the way that information was kind of teased out, the way that it was treated as a narrative, so to speak, left me with some dissatisfaction essentially. It's start to finish a legal accounting more or less of this guy and his wife basically turning on him and this these horrific legal proceedings, losing his kids, his wife, like it is a bonkers story. And if you are interested in family law, if you are interested in incredibly contentious divorce, uh, parental alienation, especially the legal sides of that, a legal battle for to save your kids basically, yeah, read it. I highly recommend it. As kind of just a chronicle of a dad, a man who had to go to hell and back to save his kids, to find his kids. The, the main thrust is two of his kids disappeared for years and years. It is a good read, but where I didn't like a technique that the book used and like it just kind of ultimately met, huh, is that the book withholds a lot of details about the before in order to basically create a suspense to smack the reader in the face every once in a while to really kind of have gotcha conflict, if that makes sense. And where I was just kind of disappointed is what I would expect from a good piece of narrative nonfiction is to, yeah, like kind of surprise me in the beginning. Like when I got, when the when the shoe dropped on this one with the, the divorce and the wife and the kids, I was like, what is this story? And it's a true story. It's really bonkers. But that is the moment where in a good piece of narrative nonfiction, you should be giving me context. 
context to help me understand who these people are, what their marriage was like, what they were like as parents, so that I can then move forward through the rest of the story with that context to kind of understand the complex psychology and kind of uh, things at play. And the book doesn't do that. The book chooses to keep all of that context from you until the very end, like 95%, when they finally interview the kids. But I found even those snippets unsatisfying because, the, I mean, the people who wrote the book are really close to the family. And it's actually kind of similar to that Menendez murders thing. Like, you appreciate sensitivity in dealing with minors, though most of them are no longer minors, which is good because they spoke to them when they were adults but it meant that they kind of had the kid gloves on still uh, and, and didn't uh, necessarily like ask the questions that I might have asked or at least it wasn't narratively written in a way that I felt really elucidated. If you're gonna keep all the critical context for me, you'd better really deliver it at the very end and the book didn't quite deliver. Next is The Unbreakable Child. And honestly, I don't want to dunk on this book too much. It is a self-published memoir, and it ultimately truly just wasn't for me. I didn't quite understand what I was getting into when I downloaded it from Kindle Unlimited. I did end up reading the whole thing, but it really wasn't for me. It just, it went really in-depth in a lot of detail into child abuse. And while reading about surviving childhood abuse, is compelling and interesting. I want kind of the reflection and maybe some narration, but I don't personally enjoy reading a blow by blow of child abuse. That is not for me. And it's just a case where the author, like with all due respect, I didn't feel was ready to write about their trauma. Parts of the book were just really unfocused. It also went really hard on the narrative style of like really getting into the head of the child. So it's like you're reading fiction and thus it's even more uncomfortable because like it's using narrative devices to try to have the characters like mentally be seven or what have you. And while theoretically effective, it ended up very uneven. There would be moments when you know that in real life the person was eight years old, but they the, the narration feels like they're five. There was actually like uh, by the point, time the real person in the narration was ten, they felt way younger than ten, and it was very confusing and kind of brought up questions of like how much of this is kind of massaging real memories and trying to like make it feel more narrative. Like, is this embellished? And those are questions you really want to ask about, about a poor trauma victim, survivor of childhood abuse. And so it just ultimately really didn't land for me. It's one that desperately needed a little more perspective or like a third party to write it, like a case where someone who survived something horrific would tell their story to someone else and that person like a journalist or a ghostwriter would kind of like put in some of that cushioning, uh, both for the sake of the person whose story it was as well as for readers. It just, it really, it needed polish that it didn't have. Okay, next is a really f funny one. Like, why did I read this book? Uh, Unfiltered by Lily Collins was just laughably bad. <laughs> it was so, like, just shallow, and there wasn't much to it. It was bad. But it also, like, literally just a case of not for me. I was not the audience for that book. I, t I knew it going in. But, like, at the same time, you can write a memoir about a child star. You can write a memoir that's definitely targeted toward their fans and still give it substance. The book took itself just a little bit too seriously, and it's it was basically, like, cotton candy. Cotton candy fluff. And yet, literally, in the Goodreads description, it said, like, it's, like, one of the most groundbreaking books of her time or something ridiculous like that, and it's just, like, gotta side-eye it. That said, it is a book for some people, and I know, especially when it came out, which was a few years ago, it was a really important instance of a young Hollywood figure who has a lot of young fans being very open about her struggles with her eating disorder as well as abusive boyfriends, and I know that is very important to talk about, but yeah, the the book is cotton candy. And last is an education in ruin. I enjoyed a large chunk of the reading experience for this one. My kind of 
disappointment is just it takes a little bit for the book to get going when I got to the midpoint and I said it in my original review like they go to like this ski chalet and then it's like then it really hits on like the rich people tropes and it gets there's this corporate intrigue plot that was really interesting and so this one is just was very slow to start I had to really push to get to that middle for the story to start going and to feel like I was really in the immediacy of the story, I and I did get engaged in the romance, I got engaged in the suspense plot, but it's one that just kind of like fell in the middle for me, basically. So those are my favorite books of 2020 and some of the ones that I either flat out didn't like or just kind of didn't meet my expectations or I found slightly disappointing. All right, now's the fun part. Let's talk down below in the comments. I mean, you can hit me with your favorites because that's great, but let's be real. What books disappointed you in 2020? I feel like that's what we really want to talk about when we talk about these things because, I mean, figuring out what you don't like helps you figure out what you do like. You know, 2020, not a great year, and yet once I got over my reading slump, I did have a reading slump. I read some great books this year. They were wonderful distractions darker than usual. What a shock. But uh, I, I'm happy with my reading year. I, I feel like I feel good about my reading year. Give this video a thumbs up if you like it. I will make more bookish content. And if you're not already subscribed to the channel, go ahead and do that. I post new videos two to three times a week. As always, guys, thank you so much for watching and happy reading.